In 1798, directly in the wake of the Pathétique, which was a huge success for Beethoven right after its publication, he wrote two further sonatas. The Sonata in E major, opus 14, number one, and the Sonata in G major, opus 14, number two. And musically, they are almost a complete contrast, antithesis of the Pathétique. The Pathétique is dark, dramatic. It is orchestral music written for the piano. It is an outburst of passionate emotions. It's constructed with exquisite dramaturgy, which grabs you and shatters you and thrills you. All of this is, I would say, almost negated in these two sonatas. They are much more chamber in spirit. They are much more relaxed. They are both in major keys. They are content which is a mood which we normally do not associate with Beethoven. So this element of striving against the boundaries which the Pathetic is full of just does not appear in this music at all. I feel that not only it is a contrast or antithesis, but almost an antidote to the Pathetic, as if Beethoven, after this peak which he reached with the Pathetic, needed something clear and clean for himself to bathe his soul and his spirit in, and this was the result. Nonetheless, despite the much more modest musical utterance which these two sonatas present, we see through the sketches and through the preparation that he has lavished them with the same kind of love, care and attention which he brought to every piece he wrote, whether a famous sonata with a name that would remain popular and love 200 years later, or a sonata which later became less known and popular and which we normally only play within the full cycle. Um, to speak about the music itself, the beginning is based on a sequence of rising fourths. Uh, which is a very basic element, which he then uses to make a uh, a melody. Um, something interesting throughout the sonata, despite the impression we have when listening that it is a sequence of new melodies and materials presented, actually most of them are developed through very small cellular units. For example, this sequence of fourths. After the first phrase, We have the following passages which seem new and unconnected. But actually they are derived from the elements which we already had in the beginning. So these ones, which seem like a sequence of thirds, if we look at them from the second note, they are actually a sequence of rising fourths, which are the same rising fourths we had here. And the third one here is not a fourth, but a sixth. And so this one starts with the same sixth as this. So the idea of using very basic elements to build new material, this is something which will uh, be a line throughout the sonata. The um, second theme is an interesting device of using just a single line and only later we have a chord accompanying diatonic and chromatic. A repeat, and now he uses this idea and turns it into a polyphonic one. So 
there's one line which plays the whole melody, which is the tenor. And it is surrounded by bits of the motif played in the bass and in the soprano above and below it, creating exquisite dissonances. These three notes in passing create three dissonances in a row. Um, it passes very quickly and then it gets resolved here. But it adds a lot of spice, as it were, to what is otherwise a very plain line. Also, this beautiful dissonance. And again. And then uh, something which once again appears a new idea. But interestingly, if we reverse the last notes, these are of course what we had here. So he takes the same notes, transposes them to the soprano, reverses them, writes them twice as slowly, and all of a sudden we have new material. But new material which uses the exact same material which we already had before. This is not to say that this music sounds the same. The opposite, the idea is to very economically use these cellular building blocks to create a large variety of something which we as listeners perceive constantly as new music. So, of course, for us, the distance between this and this is huge. This is a, a passing line in the bass. This is a singing line in the soprano. And yet, I find it very cool that they are effectively one and the same. A closing section. beautiful, almost Schubertian. And the closing of the exposition is a mysterious repeat of the main theme in the bass. back to the repeat of the exposition. Um, one thing to note which is of interest is the tempo and the pulse of the movement. It is very tempting to play it as if this were the basic units of pulse. So that is one, two, one, two. This is something we call a la breve, which means twice as fast, where the bar is written in four, but is counted in two. And Beethoven very often used that. But here, interestingly, he does not. And he's very careful in separating movements that are a la breve and those that aren't a la breve. And here, he definitely wants it not in two, but in four, which means that even though it's allegro, it shouldn't be too fast. We should feel the pulse of one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Once again, connecting to the idea of these sonatas not being extreme, not being necessarily virtuosic, but something which is a little bit more relaxed and I would almost say comfortable. In the sketches which we have for the sonata and this sonata, uh, the E major one, was extensively sketched and we have these sketches, he uh, wrote an interesting thing, a, marge, co a margin comment about the development do not develop the theme. So um, he wanted to write a development which would be based on new material. But let's see how, how, how he actually did this. So it starts the same way. 
Instead of major, he goes to minor. And then we indeed have something which we perceive as completely new material, where previously the pulse was always so quiet, measured and steady. Here we have something much more emotional. with a very beautiful, imploring and personal line in the right hand. So it really sounds like something which has absolutely no connection to the material before. But if we look a little bit closer, actually we once again have this line. So this is an upbeat and the downbeat is here. But if we just play these first five notes without thinking of the rhythm, you might recall it's our which he then used here in reversal. So different notes, but the same intervals. We do not perceive it because he displaces the rhythm. If before it was downbeat, now it's downbeat. And the left hand is different and it's in a minor key. So there are many changes which lead us to hear this as completely new material. Um, but in fact, once again, it is based on the same cell, musical cell, which he already used and developed in the exposition. But in terms of mood, in terms of the emotion conveyed in this music, of course, it is um, new. Um, and this is the core of the development. Only at the very end, he comes back to the main theme. towards the reprise. But here, instead of our... He writes something much more extrovert. Why? Just for variety, just for a sense of arrival of homecoming and because he was a great virtuoso and perhaps even in a relaxed sonata he couldn't quite resist showing off a little bit in the uh, in the left hand. Um, then a, a bit later where in the exposition we have gone back to E major, here we have a surprise. C major. C major which is a bit unexpected, which is related to E major just by the common note, E. And what is interesting that in the sketches he wrote a big modulatory passage leading from E major to C major, so that this strange transition would be less strange. But then apparently he realized that actually the fact that it is strange and unexpected is good. It's a good kind of surprise, a surprise which works for the audience, and thus he cut out the entire long modulatory section and just left it as an abrupt transition. I'd like to point the attention to this element. Which is uh, very much what we had here. 
but this is almost reverse development. He takes an element which he introduces in the development and then develops it or goes back to it in the reprise. Once again, creating these uh, connecting links between the material. It's even if we are not aware of these connections while listening, and probably we aren't because this is just one bar and who will notice that this is the same motive which was before twice as slow. But subconsciously we perceive the links and it helps us create a sense of unity and coherence in the music. Uh, then the rest of the reprise is as in the exposition, just transposed into the home key of E major. And I'd like to show uh, two little corners. I said that these sonatas do not strive against the boundaries. And one boundary which Beethoven was constantly striving against was the edges of the keyboard. The keyboard throughout his entire life was too small for him. At the time, the keyboard was from uh, this F to this F. And in previous sonatas, he made a huge point of being constantly at the edges and uh, repeating chords at the edges as if he was fighting against these edges and he wanted to transcend them, to burst through them. Here he doesn't quite do that, but even so, there are two little spots where he is obliged to do things in order to overcome the challenge of the keyboard ending here and here. And one of them is uh, this passage, which when it's on the lower octave, goes up and then he goes an octave higher. And it should have been, but he cannot go here because he doesn't have these notes. So what he does instead, he goes down with the upper voice and then jumps to the lower octave. So instead of, we get, which maybe is more elegant if we show the lower line make it a seamless tr a transition. And the second place is in the coda. Where we have a really atmospheric chord. This distance between the minor and the major, which you explored a few times in this movement here, is brought to sharp relief. And interestingly, he writes an octave and a single note, an octave and a single note. And the reason, of course, is that he doesn't have this E, so he cannot write two octaves. So instead, he goes as low as he can, but then he is obliged to just write one note. But perhaps it functions well because it means that the focus and the attention of the low edge is just for the unexpected note. And then this has less attention. And then for the final section, the main motive rises up and evaporates. Again, a very non-dramatic ending. The most dramatic moment is this. And I think you probably agree that compared to the drama of the pathetic, this drama is very minor and self-contained. But even so, within the, within the parameters of this movement, this is still a moment of tension and of something dark and maybe slightly scary. The second movement is a beautiful possibly lullaby. Um, it is in E minor, so the, the relative uh, minor key. Oh, sorry, the parallel minor key. I keep confusing these two terms in English. 
um, the relative would have been uh, C sharp minor. Um, the tempo allegretto is interesting. It is in three fourths, and the question is, what is our basic unit of pause? Is it the whole bar? Is it quavers? One, two, three, one, two, three, two. Or even, as sometimes it is played, even um, shorter notes. So more um, possibly sadder, possibly more um, funereal. For me personally, the beat is the full bar. So it's one, two, three, four. One of the reasons because it gives it a wonderful lilt, which corresponds to this idea of a lullaby in my mind, which I think fits the music, but also because of the middle section of the movement, which is in C major. And if in the opening we have changes of harmony every bar, in the major section it is almost the same harmony throughout. So if it is too slow, if we take the quarter notes as our pulse, one, two, three, one, then we are all of a sudden stuck in a very long passage of effectively only C major with a hint of the dominant chord. And there is nothing, there is no harmonic change which would alleviate this, um, I would say, harmonic flatness. So to make that major section work, I think we need a more flowing tempo. Which would treat these four bars as one unit. And then, by necessity, it has to be the same tempo in the beginning. which I think works um, quite harmonically, quite harmoniously between the, the sections. This motif here, again, this idea of going down is of course harking back to different mood, different atmosphere, different presentation, different meter, but the same idea of this oscillation between the main note, half a tone lower, and coming to the main note. And I think in a way there is a musical connection between these sections, this sense of something heartfelt, something quite personal. Whereas this is um, mostly pleasant, um, but it does not necessarily express something deep or intimate. This and this for me definitely do. They are coming from the heart, they are they're emotionally very strong. Um, in the sketches we see that the middle section was supposed to be in E major and then he decided to take it to C major. Um, C major was a key which we already encountered in the first movement and here between the E minor and C major the relationship is one which he would also explore in other pieces. Um, this uh, juxtaposition appears also in the horn sonata opus 17 it appears in the um, second of the Razumovsky string quartets, Opus 59, number two, and 
for the piano it appears in the fourth concerto where the second movement in E minor ends of course in E minor and then the finale starts as if in C major We then find out that the finale is actually in G major, being a G major concerto, but the illusion is of C major. The note which links the two is of course the E, and the same thing he, which he does in the concerto, ending on the E and then starting on the E, he does here in the second movement. He ends on the E, and the E also starts the section. One interesting thing to note, this is the only sonata which Beethoven arranged himself for string quartet. And apparently it was a craze at the time. He was complaining about this craze because he felt that the distance between the piano and the string instruments was too great to bridge. And there's an interesting letter to his publisher where he says, yeah, actually only Mozart was able to do this and maybe Haydn and me. Uh, not in these words, but he said, I do not want to compare myself to these great men but actually, I've just finished an arrangement of one of these of my sonatas for string quartet, which was this, and I dare say that nobody else could have done it the same way that I did, because he said you have to be a composer to arrange this kind of transition between the piano to the strings. The quartet which resulted uh, did not enter the repertoire, even though Beethoven himself arranged it, he even transposed the sonata from E major, which is quite uncomfortable for the strings, to F major, which is much more comfortable, and yet it didn't quite take. And very interesting, with the one point in the sonata, which seems to be a string effect, which is unplayable on the piano, was not transported to the strings. Here, in the transition, He writes a crescendo on this note, but we cannot make a crescendo on one note. So we can create an illusion by playing this note much louder than the uh, upper note, but this uh, could have been really easily done by the first violin in the quartet, and yet that particular effect he chose not to transport. The finale is a unusual, one could almost say curious theme. So he has seven repeating notes. First here, three, but then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And um, this is almost like a joke, and we know that he loved musical jokes, and with exquisite sense of humor and timing, this is like a gun which he lays on the table in the first deck of the play, according to Chekhov's law, if there's a gun in the first act, in the third act, this gun must fire. And this idea of the seven repeating notes, which is repeated with innocence every single time this motive recurs, many times, this being rondo, is then, um, it does explode in the end of the movement. So first he writes, I, I've jumped a few pages forward, he writes the same motive in syncopation. And then the left, because it was always in the right hand that these uh, repeated octaves appeared, it is as if the left hand said enough and in fortissimo the left hand plays <laughs> so 
so real craziness twice this group of uh, seven notes and he writes the right hand short and the left hand long and in syncopation to make sure that our attention is fully on the left hand <laughs> So he probably knew that he would get there when he wrote this theme, but in the beginning when we just hear it, it's just curious, unexpected, but still quite innocent. Um, this is a rondo with a middle section which is one of the only virtuosic places in the sonata. And so it goes. But it is relatively short. Um, one other little joke I can show. The second theme So first is the same idea as here of starting the line just with one voice. We don't know, is this G major all of a sudden? No. But the second time it appears, he plays this joke even further. It should have been. Instead, we've got to an F major all of a sudden, but then he does manage to get out of it. And then after this explosion, which I showed you with the twice seven repeated octaves in fortissimo in the left hand, and there's a kind of calming down. But once again, seven octaves in the left hand, but this time in a decrescendo. And then there's a final recurrence of the opening theme. nothing had happened and the sonata just finishes. So not a very typical Beethoven sonata but one which is full of charm and one which I find lingers with you for longer than you might have expected.